Welcome to Beyond the Frame, a show by the Soka Global Outreach Office, sharing the new, the now, and the necessary in a digest of thought-provoking news and tidbits from around the global art world with a particular focus on marginalized voices. We bring you news and stories centered around equity, inclusivity, and sustainability, exploring the places where art is urgent, political, and current, while reflecting on the complexities of today's world. My name is Jillian Rhodes, and I am your host. So let's start with the news. It'll be a packed episode, as we haven't done a normal news show in a while. As we get into the fall, it's festival season and art market season. We can't report on everything, so as usual, I've selected a couple of interesting festivals that match beyond the frames, well, framing. We start in South Korea with the Sea Art Festival in Busan, which happens on alternating years with the Busan Biennial. The festival has been ongoing since 1987. And this year, the theme is Flickering Shores Sea Imaginaries and, quote, is an invitation to reimagine our relationship with the sea, marine species, and environments through art and culture." Unquote. The festival will feature works by 40-plus artists and collectives from 20 countries. The festival is interesting for a couple reasons. The first is that it was originally designed to take place on Ilguang Beach, which is a public space, taking art from the white cube space to the public. Of course, as the festival has grown, it does include other spaces, but the sea is front and center. Because the theme investigates and critiques human impact on the sea, placing the artworks at the scene of the crime, so to speak, adds another level. Secondly, it's not just about the artwork some of which is, of course, more abstract than others, from conceptual films to creating decoration from trash washed up on the beach. The festival also features a collectively written manifesto and a symposium around the theme, as well as numerous public workshops with craft-making activities to raise awareness of certain issues. It's an interesting example of social activism and awareness blended with fine art. And next, we move on to the Unsound Festival, held yearly in Krakow, Poland, although it does have offshoots in other cities as well. Unsound, as the name might suggest, is a festival that, quote, focuses on a broad swath of contemporary music, unquote which means that the artists and performances defy any traditional boundaries of genre. It is wild, unbound, and unsound, literally and metaphorically, featuring a huge variety of sounds, artist talks and discussions, workshops, and more. They feature trans-border and transdisciplinary work, such as sound-inspired perfume and a residency by a collective called machine listening, blending sound, data, AI, and more. The one thing that most interested me was the announcement on their website that this year would feature an artificially intelligent artistic director who would help with the curation process. This was connected to the theme of Dada in reference to the Dada movement, which favored nonsense and radicalism over logic and rationality. This AIAD was trained to provide bizarre advice on programming, with the idea of pushing its human counterparts to think more creatively. The AIAD provided reports throughout the festival as well, and a humorous piece was released after the festival, which said that the AI. AD was being fired for trying to take over all programming with AI-related artists. I don't doubt that an AI model was used, though it wouldn't be interesting to know the extent to which it was involved. I think it is the best way to use an AI, though, to write summaries and to give strange advice. 
As a last note on the exhibition or festival perspective, I noticed an article in the Art Review about an upcoming exhibition by the Museum of Sao Paulo entitled Indigenous Histories, which will feature 285 works from around 170 artists from indigenous communities. What's really interesting is a note on the website which states that the exhibition title has multiple meanings in the Portuguese translation of histories, which encompasses both fiction and non-fiction, historical accounts as well as personal ones, of a public and private nature on a micro or macro level. This touches on different ways of knowing, which is also a fundamental aspect of decolonial education. We wrap up the news section with an announcement that UNESCO is commissioning a virtual museum to showcase stolen artwork. The information of the artworks will be provided by Interpol's database of looted artworks and rendered in 3D in an interactive virtual space designed by Burkina Faso architect Francis Carré, the first African-born architect to win the prestigious Pritzker Architecture Prize. On a similar theme, an article in the art newspaper notes that Germany's many convents and monasteries are beginning a process to decide what to do about a number of colonial-era objects that various missionaries brought back with dubious provenance or obtained as gifts. While repatriation is one route they are considering, it's a large cataloging project uh, that requires budget and attention, and so they are unsure what exactly will come of it. At least they are considering repatriation. The British Museum, in response to the thefts I discussed in the last episode, are continuing to ignore the issue entirely and rather focusing on a huge amount of money on digitizing their entire collection. Let's move on to the trends section. You know by now that I spend a lot of time in this show talking about decolonization and equity in the arts world, and that's because it really is all over the news. The discourse is there but it is a messy and complicated process and generations of discriminatory and colonial practice make it hard. Here's a case in point. Freeze London happened recently. Along with it, a number of prizes that generally go with the festival. Many of these prizes went to artists from the global south or artists representing queer, feminist and post-colonial perspectives. Many of these prizes lead to large commissions or shows, which is wonderful. And yet, in the same day, I also found an article in the art newspaper about how Christie's latest auction at Freeze netted $96.5 million. And most of these works on auction were European male creators. I wonder. Another trend of the ongoing attempt to decolonize is wrestling with what to do about showcasing the work of celebrated creators and artists who perpetuated colonial, racist, or sexist ideologies in an attempt to win back the waning interest of younger generations who care more about an artist's ideals than their work. One way that many museums and galleries are dealing with this is by displaying the artist alongside works by younger artists that comment on the same topics to create a dialogue and allow the viewer to make their own opinions. It is complicated though. I personally wonder about how the present judges the past, missing current inequalities in the process. I found a very interesting article in the Art News that critically approaches this very question and asks this uncomfortable question. What are we to do about art history when so much of it features and celebrates the colonial world? Today's featured artist, in fact, works on this very question and approaches it in a very novel and intriguing way. Today I'm talking about Morishan Aliari, an Iranian media artist, activist, and writer. 
Her work is multidisciplinary and touches on elements of performance, storytelling, 3D modeling, web art, animations, and more. If I could try to explain it from my perspective, she doesn't create objects or visuals that exist on their own. Rather, she creates a web of connected threads that come together around a certain idea, object, image, or all of the above. I first became aware of her when I was editing a paper around digital heritage, where I came across her work centered on digital colonialism, or essentially how Western companies digitize cultural heritage sites from the global south in a way that removes ownership from the original culture and positions the West as the savior of global culture. Aliari's project, Material Speculation ISIS and Physical Tactics for Digital Colonialism, are two projects that particularly deal with this topic. These deal with artifacts, 3D scanning techniques, history, and open access. I'll include links to learn more about these projects, and I do recommend you read more, as it's very thought-provoking. Recently, Aliari has turned her attention to AI and the inherent biases present in these huge projects, which has been a topic on this show before. In particular, her project Moonfaced deals with how Western depictions and standards of beauty changed Persian culture and paintings. She has spoken candidly in interviews on how AI can perpetuate bias and through this project shows how careful curation and development can actually help AI undo bias. However, it must be done intentionally, as neutrality always favors the powerful. I think most of all, I just deeply admire how Aliari has positioned herself as an artist. Along with the work, she provides interviews and extra information that grounds the artwork in a context, using both the work itself and the storytelling around it to draw attention to inequalities and colonial remnants. She is, by all means, an established artist and works with large institutions, and yet she also considers accessibility as a priority. I find her incredibly inspiring. And if there is any artist I'd like to grow up to be, it would be someone like Aliari. All right, so this episode is getting a little long already, so let's just wrap up with a few tidbits. First, we start with an article in Art News, which discussed a report that found that out of 1,900 museum workers in the U.S. that were surveyed, 74% reported that their salary was not enough to cover the cost of living. Even executives were not safe, as 29% of these 74 were in executive positions. 68% said they had considered leaving the field. And this is an incredible figure and shows just how unstable the U.S. museum scene truly is. I leave it there without further commentary. And next up, I noticed a couple articles on the shifting centers of art in the art newspaper. One was on Saudi Arabia's sudden rise into the cultural sector, something that I've personally heard of a lot in recent months as well. The other was on the challenges of the contemporary art scene in Atlanta to gain national recognition. This one was interesting in that it particularly highlighted the struggle I mentioned in the trend section. On the one hand, celebrating the grassroots, non-mainstream arts culture, while still trying to earn a place in the white cube world. It's linked below and worth a read. Finally, we end with an article that I actually saw a few months ago but didn't get a chance to report on yet. It was about how a number of Bored Ape Yacht Club collectors sued Sotheby's over the auction house's 2021 auction of this NFT collection. The collectors claimed that it lent a false sense of credibility and falsely inflated prices, as Sotheby had stated that, that one of the Bored Ape, Ape NFTs had been collected by a traditional collector 
and thus implying that NFTs had entered the mainstream art world. The NFT world continues to suffer, as recently Yuga Labs, the group behind Bored Apes, has started to lay off workers. The result of this lawsuit has yet to be announced, but it will be interesting to follow. Well, I think that is just about enough for today. All the links are available in the description. And thank you for watching Beyond the Frame, a project by the Soka Global Outreach Office.